for you. 2022 is the year of for you. The gospel for you, Jesus for you, righteousness, salvation, forgiveness of sins for you. And today we look forward to what is to come, to the year of 2023 beyond a reasonable doubt. That it is beyond a reasonable doubt that Jesus is for you. And that, my friends, that is the key to the gospel. Because if Jesus is not for you, if, if the gospel is simply for, for someone else, there's no benefit for you. If Jesus died for, for them over there, there's no forgiveness of sins for you. There's no hope. There's no comfort. There's no justification. There's no s salvation unless Jesus is for you. We must be beyond a reasonable doubt that Jesus is for you because that is where our hope lies. How can we be so sure? How can we be so certain that Jesus is for you? That is what we have done in 2022 for you. Jesus is for you in his word and in his sacraments. Your baptism is your baptism. It does not belong to anyone else. Those waters of holy baptism were not poured upon the head of someone else, but on that day, your head got wet. That water that is combined with God's word and included in God's command, that was poured upon your head. You were named a child of God. You were given the forgiveness of sins. You were given that salvation on that day. Not your neighbor, not them out there, not someone else, you. Christ died for you. Jesus speaks to you. He speaks to you in the words of your pastor that God has called specifically one man to stand as your pastor. Not for someone else, not another place, another time, but your pastor is the one that God has called. He has ordained, he has chosen to speak his word to you, to stand before you in the chancel of your church and say, as a called, ordained servant of Christ, I forgive you all of your sins. Those words are for you. Not another, but they are yours spoken to you by your pastor, the one man that God has called and ordained and chosen to speak his words to you. You are forgiven. The office, the absolution, spoken specifically to you. Whether it be publicly in church or in private, perhaps at the altar rail, perhaps in an office, your sins are given. You. Jesus comes. He speaks. He comes to you in his flesh, in the body and blood that is bread and wine. He comes for you. That bread and that wine that is distributed by that man called by God to give it to you is put into your mouth. Not the mouth of the person next to you or the one beside you, but that bread that is his body. Take it. Eat it. It's for you. This cup and the wine that is his blood in here, this is for you. It is shed for you for the forgiveness of all of your sins. Without a reasonable doubt. God has instituted these things as a gift. The waters, the bread, the wine. That grain that grew on the stalk out in the field, God had intended it, chose it to be for you, that it would be ground and made into bread so that that bread could be put upon your mouth for the forgiveness of your sins. God knew that grape as it grew on the vine, that he grew it there for the very purpose of making it into wine to be his blood shed for you. Take it. God made this for you, for the forgiveness of your sins, beyond a reasonable doubt. Again and again, God comes. He comes and he speaks for you, to you, 
to forgive you. Week in, week out, again and again, and again, and again, and again, and again, and again, God comes. Why? Why so many times? Why in so many and various different ways? In water, in word, in, in a man, in bread and wine. Why so much? Why so often? Beyond a reasonable doubt for you. He comes because doubt is real. Doubt is real for you and for me and for the person in the pew next to you. The struggles are real. Your sin is real. The brokenness of this world, everything that we endure, all of the pressures that build upon us, that we carry upon our shoulders, those, those are real. They're heavy. They weigh a lot. Sometimes it's difficult. Sometimes it's difficult to believe that it is all for you. Sometimes it is difficult to believe that Jesus could be for you. Does he know what I've done? If he did, would he still speak? If, if my pastor knew the sins that I have committed, if he knew the doubt that is in my heart, would he still say your sins are forgiven? It's hard to believe in this world that tells us there is no God. It's difficult to believe in this world that tells us, no, creation is a myth, evolution is truth. It's difficult to believe in this world that does not embrace and preach mercy and grace and forgiveness, but threatens to cancel you, to, to call you out, to, to send you on your way for just one mistake. And that's what we know. When, we, when that's what we experience, when that is what everything outside of us says, it's hard. It's hard to believe that there is truth when everything around us says, no, it's only my truth that matters. Does God really exist? Is he really there? Well, we know, right? We are Christians. We know better. We are better, aren't we? We wouldn't dare doubt the existence of God. That makes it even harder. Because is it Christian to doubt? Is it Christian to doubt that God's forgiveness is for you when, when he has these wonderful gifts of baptism and, and absolution and the Lord's Supper, his word and his sacraments? How can I doubt? And yet, we do. What does that say about me? How does it make us feel when our doubts are real? makes us feel like we're the ones that aren't right. We, we are the ones that don't fit in. We, we are the ones that are out of line. We are the bad Christians. Really, if our neighbor knew, surely they wouldn't sit next to us in the pew, would they? Doubt is hard. Your neighbor doubts. Your pastor struggles with sin too. That's who we are. That is who we are, sinful and unclean human beings. It is human to doubt. Doubt is difficult. But here's the good news. God knows it. God knows you are going to doubt. God knows your doubt, and he still washes you with water. God knows your sin, and he still sends you a pastor. God knows your struggle, and he still grows that grain in the field and that grape on the vine for you. God knows that the devil is going to come and tempt you, just like he did to Adam and Eve. Did God really say... Did God really do? Is God really for you? 
Does God even exist? Does God even care? Does God even? The devil's temptations come. They come fast, they come hard, they sometimes cripple us and cause us to fall. But what they don't do is they don't go unanswered. God has an answer for our doubt. God has an answer for our struggle, not just in the for you of the gospel, but in the does God even? And it all comes down to one thing. Our hope, our beyond a reasonable doubt comes down to one teaching of the faith. That is what we hang our hope on, our everything on, one thing, the resurrection of Christ. As our theme verse says, if Christ has not been raised from the dead, our preaching is in vain and your faith is in vain. If Christ is not raised from the dead, it is all useless, it is all worthless, it is all for nothing. But, but if Christ is raised from the dead, then it's not in vain. If Christ is raised from the dead, if, if there are eyewitnesses that come and give a, a reliable and consistent account that is able to be taken as truth, well, then we have hope. Then we have something to look forward to. If there is evidence not just in the scriptures, just in the Bible. If, if there are extra biblical sources, things outside of scripture even that tell us that Jesus is real and Jesus died on the cross and, and Jesus rose again from the dead. And these are not even Christian authors. You see there, we have hope. There we have hope confidence. If history for thousands of years, if, if those that were there present could not refute the fact that Christ was raised from the dead, if every one of those apostles, save John, was willing to give up their life, if so many of those of the early church were willing to lay down their lives for this one thing, that Christ was raised from the dead, there we have hope. There we can wonder. We might even say we can be beyond a reasonable doubt. These things, dear brothers and sisters in Christ, do exist. Evidence of the scriptures, reliability of the scriptures, the, the eyewitness testimonies of so many, of, of over 500 people that saw Jesus alive after he had been crucified, their accounts are real. The names of the people in the scriptures, even enemies of Jesus himself, those names are real. They're given to us help our doubt, to point us beyond a reasonable doubt that Christ is absolutely raised from the dead. The Gospels stand the test of our doubt. Doubt them. Doubt them boldly. Ask questions, investigate them, do the research, go into the history, go into the scriptures, compare the, math, the, the gospel of, of Matthew and Mark and John and Luke and look at the events in the books of Acts. Look at the history of each of these historical books in both the New and the Old Testament and, and compare them to the history that we have and that we know. You will see we are beyond a reasonable doubt. You will see that they stand not just up to a decent enough standard that, well, it's enough for you. They stand to all doubt. This faith 
Jesus Christ. His resurrection from the dead stands beyond a reasonable doubt because God knows we doubt. Jesus stands out of the grave. The gospel stands for you. For your doubt, God gives an answer. For your sin, God gives an answer. For your salvation, God gives an answer. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Alleluia. Amen.